Um, to introduce us though, my name is Michael Maddox. I'm the JSNA Programme Manager at Warwickshire County Council, so absolutely right, I was the JSNA Programme Manager in the uh, in the previous mentee. And I'm presenting today with uh, Matthew Head and Tom Mansbridge, who are both analysts in our population health business intelligence team, um, who worked on this Empowering Futures JSNA. Um, hopefully you'll still be able to see the code at the top, and I've left the QR code on a few slides so that people can jump in if you, if you haven't managed to already. But this is a, a little overview of what we're going to be going over today. So um, it's going to focus on our Empowering Futures JSNA, but actually I'm going to start by just explaining some of the background to what we've been doing with the JSNA in Warwickshire and sort of setting the scene. Then talking a bit about the approach to the Empowering Futures JSNA and why it was a bit different. Um, we then got a demo of the dashboard we created. Uh, we've got a quiz, which is one of the interactive elements. We're then going to talk a little bit about how we used Agile project management for this project to get a new approach to creating JSNAs, which um, which in, yielded some very interesting results. Then some project implications and reflections, and then some time for sort of Q&A. And also we'd love to hear other JSNA best practice. So if you've done JSNAs or got JSNAs that you think are, are particularly interesting or yielding particularly good results, we'd love to hear about it. I'm going to start by going over what a JSNA is. I appreciate a lot of people in this room will probably know this already, but in case there's anybody newer to JSNAs or a, a quick refresh. So joint strategic needs assessments, JSNAs, are reviews of health and care needs and strengths of the population, and they provide an evidence base that can then go into a, a range of strategic activity, including the commissioning and delivery of services, as well as other activity like funding bids and similar as an evidence base there. And of course, things like our health equity um, assessment tool, the HEAT tool and other um, equalities tools that we might use. Their responsibilities and statutory uh, responsibilities of health and wellbeing boards, which is sort of important for two reasons. Firstly, when we say it's a statutory responsibility, each health and wellbeing board has to have one, but there's no guidance in how we do them. That's left completely up to local health and wellbeing boards, which means everybody's JSNA programme looks a bit different. And it gives us the opportunity to tailor what we do with the JSNA to local need and, and similar. And then it's important um, in a second way in that health and wellbeing boards are made up of a number of partners. And so these are more than just local authority documents, but they should be used by NHS trusts, ICB, voluntary community sector, everybody around the health and, and, and care system. And that really goes into the last point on this slide about these being joint documents, as well as them being able to be used by multiple organisations, actually, in order to create them, the joint aspect is very important, getting in different partners and stakeholders, both from a data perspective, so we're accessing data from different areas, but also in terms of a, a customer stakeholder to get input in into how we use this data and write the narrative around the data and having that collective that, that comes together. This is what we have done historically in, in Warwickshire with the JSNA work programme, and it sort of broadly splits into two areas. We did a place-based needs assessment approach for three years back in 2017 to 2020. And in this, we split the county into 22 different areas. And we did a health profile for each of these areas, which gives an overview for, for each of these 22 areas as to what health needs are specifically for those areas. Since 2022, we've taken a thematic approach. Um, picking a population or a condition and doing a needs assessment for the whole county for for that population or condition or mixture of both. Um, and within that, we then try to pull out the differences of, uh, amongst place, so whether we can go down to the 22 JSNA areas or whether it's thinking about our district in boroughs and, and that sort of variation. And you can see a bit of an overview there of what we have done as well as what we're currently working on. And I guess to highlight particularly that we, we've done a few children's JSNAs. We had a children's 0 to 5 JSNA back in 2022. We had a children and young people mental health JSNA in 2023. And this Empowering Futures JSNA, sort of a, a third children's JSNA, um, com uh, completing a suite of three products. We've had a few reflections from what we've done with our previous JSNA work program that have come into uh, the Empowering Futures JSNA and again sort of setting the scene of why we did the approach we did for Empowering Futures. 
And I'm going to highlight four particular ones here. The first is that JSNAs can be very long written reports. I mean, our average was about 150 to 200 pages long. And this is very long and it can be off putting for people to sit down and read and actually make it quite hard for people to pull out all of the information that's that's in there that might be relevant to them. Um, similarly to having created long reports, we've made a lot of recommendations and actually for the first two of our children's JSNAs I mentioned on the previous slide, between them we produced 82 recommendations in that, which is a huge amount that the system then needs to respond to. The third is we've produced them quite quickly, which might sound like a good thing, right, that we're, we're churning them out and getting out this evidence base, but actually when we're producing 150, 200 page documents every three months and then chucking it at the system and go respond to these recommendations and we'll see you in three months with the next 80. Uh, actually, that that starts to get very overwhelming. Um, and then the last one is about project pacing and scope. And I'm sure this is something that people experience in lots of different projects from different perspectives. But actually, with our JSNAs, it's it's been very much the same. If, if we run a JSNA for nine to 11 months, a lot of the work gets done in the last four months. We spend the first five talking about models for the work and, and concepts and scope. And then we go, oh gosh, we've got four months to finish this. Um, and, and it's all hands on deck. So we did a bit of thinking with this about how we can better manage that. So that sort of sets the scene with Warwickshire JSNA so far. I'm going to pass to Tom now to talk a bit about the Empowering Futures JSNA specifically. Tom, if you're talking, you may yep. be on mute. Sorry, yeah. Oh, yeah, I there lost, we go. I lost where I was. There we go. Okay. Um, so this is uh, kind of our homepage. So this is, you can find um, our dashboard within the Watch County Council website within the JSNA area. And then this is just linked off um, to our empowering features. So we have a brief introduction here, uh, but this is where people can then access the report. Um, and by clicking into it, uh, we then go into our report. So what we've, what we've developed from this um, is, a, is a full full Power BI report covering a wide range of indicators. And then when you first click onto it, uh, you get onto our onto our introduction page. Um, so introduction page just, just mainly tells you how to use it. So it gives you information on how to navigate it. And then we have a full kind of how to use explanation um, that if anyone was coming into, into this blind or, or after a long period of time. Um, obviously, we'll skip that today uh, as I'm guiding you through it. So we have kind of two main ways to navigate around the report. Uh, the first is, is a proper menu, which allows anyone to go straight to the page they're indicated in, especially if they're coming back or they're looking looking to check for, for any updates. They can just go straight to the page of interest. Um, or we can use the arrows in the bottom, which allows us to kind of flick through it like a book. Um, so start of the report just gives, gives context. They're so covering a lot of the things that, that, that Michael just talked about. Um, and what we've done for this this JSNA is rather than have all the indicators within within a long list, um, without kind of a, a narrative, um, we've used the school aged high impact areas uh, to structure them, and that also helps structure our work when we went uh, through developing this. So all the indicators are in are in one of these six areas, um, and we had experts reach these six areas to kind of feed into which of these indicators would would be most suitable, uh, and which ones would be most useful. So for all the data within this. Um, we are, um, we've kind of dedicated that we will be continuously updating this uh, multiple times a year. Um, so these indicators and this information will be refreshed and will be made as current as possible going forward. Um, so all the kind of indicators that were here, you know, this is not every single piece of data we know. This is the ones that we thought were the most relevant or the most useful and that we would be able to, to kind of keep, keep updated. So I'm just going to give a bit of a guidance uh, through kind of three areas of the report. Uh, just to show kind of kind of three examples of indicators that we've used uh, that maybe had you know somewhat different approaches to each other uh, based on the data that was available or what we thought was the most uh, the most suitable. Um, so, for example, if we start with high impact area three, so supporting healthy lifestyles. For each of these impact areas, we have a kind of uh, a front page uh, giving a bit of an introduction to the area and a bit of an idea of some of the key findings. And then again, flicking through uh, like a map, sorry, like a book. Um, for the, the healthy lifestyles, we have kind of four main indicators that we've looked at around nutrition, oral health, physical activity, uh, and obesity. 
and this kind of whole high impact area is just uh, represented on the on this this one page with the ability to flick between those areas and we've got a, a map of Warwickshire divided into those 22 uh, GSNA areas that, um, that Michael alluded to um, which gives us kind of a, a nice in between between very very small small level geographies like like MS ways and then our district boroughs which are a bit too a bit too large because there actually is quite significant differences within those areas um, so we've used that as a basis so this page so for nutrition what we've, what we've done for nutrition oral health and activity is we've used our annual health needs assessment which are uh, surveys that go to uh, year six and year nine uh, students and to the parents of reception students and based on those responses um, we've we've flagged um, certain responses um, based on the questions um, so our full detailed methodologies here kind of says says what we've considered to be a flat answer so for example if, if a child is worried um, that there is there is not enough food in the home if they're always worried about if they're often worried about that then we've counted that as a flat answer and what we're showing in our map is showing the kind of proportion of responses um, that contained flagged answers to give us an idea where where pupils or the parents of reception uh, children are concerned about these areas um, for each of the pages within here we have kind of the, these gray text boxes so we get an introduction that kind of gives you you know basically, basically what i've just said really uh, an idea of what this page is showing overall and then we also have insight um, so in the future when this when this is updated we will be updating our insight we'll be updating kind of um, what we think are the, the the most important things to draw from this data and this also gives uh, insider information beyond um, what, what's just displayed in, in any of our graphs or in any of our maps um, some of the kind of insights we saw when putting together this data um, this page includes a methodology here uh, but for all pages you can click off and you get uh, to our full uh, methodology document which goes into a bit more um, precise or more, more technical detail in terms of how we've done it and also the full sources where we got our data from um, whether that's um, internal or external so it allows anyone who has kind of further questions beyond that spot beyond what's uh, answered on the page already can then go on to find the raw data or can find links to, to who would be the relevant person within Warwickshire County Council um, to follow up so this map then allows us uh, to flick you know from nutrition um, to oral health and then on to yeah, obesity which then uses our um, ncmp uh, measurements from the national child measurement program and then is broken down into reception in year six um, for all of those those ideas you know i'm starting to say things like health needs assessment and national child measurement program for anyone who's less familiar we have included these information boxes um, for, you know, for the national child measurement for example we can click on there and we can go on to the full details on nhs digital in terms of that program and then it just helps people who are less familiar with the topic areas uh, to kind of understand it without us having to kind of spell out all, all the uh, the information all of the acronyms uh, within the text which allows us to to keep our pages relatively clean and have enough room for the the kind of insight um, so then going on to to another example so rather than flicking through um, we can then use the the menu um, to navigate uh, which also then gets us back to our, our context if we want to or into the how to use if you got stuck elsewhere um, so let's go on to uh, reducing vulnerabilities um, so this is another one of those high impact areas that's looking at various vulnerable groups um, that might have have various uh, impacts on their kind of on their on their health um, so we've, we've split this up based on on those groups as presented um, in the school aged uh, high impact area and we have kind of two sections here so this is the kind of demographic section so we're trying to say um, as, as much as we can with the available data how many of each of these groups or how many children in each of these groups uh, exist within Warwickshire um, and, and roughly where where they are and an introduction to how we're defining the group uh, what we know about the health of them uh, roughly and then any uh, recommendations um, on how to support the population so this was an example of an area um, where we talked to a, a lot of different um, groups within the council. Um, there's a lot of different people who, who have uh, interest or roles in this area um, outside of public health. So it was a good, a good chance to kind of really talk to specialists and then we got you know, relevant advice in terms of how we're defining these groups and, and, and you know, people who have already worked with these groups before in terms of what they'd recommend in terms of supporting this population. Um, so this one, for example, shows armed forces families, also children within armed forces families. And the other kind of section for this is then the the health impacts. So this shows, um, you know, for for that vulnerable group, what kind of high impact, or sorry, what kind of health impacts um, have been uh, well researched, well evidenced, um, or often cited. And this gives a, an idea, you know, for anyone who's kind of coming in to to think about which kind of vulnerable groups they should consider with their service. 
Um, this shows them, you know, which 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 groups they should consider, uh, how many they are, or how many we reckon they are, uh, where we reckon they are, and then the kind of things that that, that might be impacting them more severely um, than, than other groups within our, within Warwickshire. Um, again, with our methodology, with this then includes kind of full referencing and full citing for these, um, without again cluttering the page up too much, so people can follow back to the the raw sources. Um, <clears throat> these pages then need lists, you know, if we want to then look at the happen back to, say, yeah, gypsy Roman traveler communities, um, and then we can go back to the, the demographics, then we can look at um, how, how those how those groups break down, um, and, and again, where and what should they are. Um, and then kind of one last, last example uh, of another error or maybe a different approach um, that we've used uh, would we'll then be looking at kind of transitions. This is within the supporting self-care and improving health literacy, um, higher impact area. And then this is a lot more uh, qualitative or a lot more kind of information driven. You know, it's not an area um, particularly that we have we have exact data about, but it gives someone who's who's kind of come into this area um, an idea of the kind of the, the different transition points that there are for, for children and young people. Um, and then gives a bit of a breakdown to maybe how those transition points would, would differ um, for anyone with a long term uh, condition. So, for example, at 16, those people are then transitioning, you know, they'd be leaving secondary school. Um, and finishing their GCSEs um, like everyone else, but they'd also be starting to transition to adult healthcare services. So they might have a, a kind of a, a different workload or a different emphasis, um, you know, in addition to what, to what everyone else will be going through. Um, so that kind of gives us kind of a brief overview of how to navigate. We've got our kind of flicking through and we've got our, our menu to, to go to a specific page. Uh, we've got our introduction and our how to use at the start. And then the kind of final thing, the final thing we have on here is we have then our link to our conclusions and our recommendations, which I'll leave for now because we're kind of covering that in the second half of the, of the presentation. Um, but the idea was to have the, the full JSNA report is on here. Um, the full JSNA report will, will remain live, will be updated, the insight will be changed um, so that we can kind of continue using it and it doesn't just kind of fade into, into obscurity. Um, so I'll hand back over, uh, I think, to Matthew, who's going to be doing a quiz. I'm just going to jump in quickly first, if I may. I'm um, going to quickly talk over a little bit of context for the project. But whilst I do this, I want to encourage you all to try and find the dashboard. Now, we were going to pop the link in the chat, but unfortunately, I, I can't see the chat. So um, Matthew has popped it in Rachel's mentee in the questions bit. So you've got the, the address there. The address is hopefully simply simply www.warwickshire.gov.uk forward slash empowering futures or you can go to google and if you google warwickshire jsna hopefully our landing page will come up and then you can then see empowering futures there so i'd encourage you to start pulling it up because it will be important for the um for the quiz bit that matthew's going to do in one moment and whilst you're pulling that up though just uh um now you've seen the dashboard and so all it's got in and what it can do. A bit of background about why we did this. So um, this was prioritised as, as part of our JSNA prioritisation process. And I mentioned at the beginning, JSNA is aligning and being used for commissioning uh, and recommissioning of services. We often align our JSNAs to the commissioning of services. So there was are some important um, discussions and decisions around the school nursing service in Warwickshire that are coming up. Um, and we also have a children and young person making every contact count offer, which is being developed. Both of these were, were prime use cases of why we developed the dashboard. Um, and we sort of had three principles behind developing it. The first is that it's interactive. So as you've seen, you can go in, play with the data. Um, it's a lot more fun than opening up a 200 page document, I hope anyway. It's iterative, which means we can keep on building it. And the plan is that now it's published, actually, A, the data is going to stay up to date and we've got a process in place to, to update that. But secondly, we can continue on building it. So rather than in four years time, we get another request to do a children's health JSNA. Actually, we're going to slowly build onto it and update it so that it's more of a continual process. And thirdly, it's editorial. So rather than, for example, with childhood obesity, chucking 10 indicators around childhood obesity into a document and saying here's all the information we had a lot of discussions about what is the key point that we want people to take away what is the the key message at the minute and then what is the data that shows that so it provides that that specific snapshot in order to create it we used an agile project management approach over the course of nine months which i'm going to talk about a bit after the quiz 
Um, and then I mentioned that we produced a lot of recommendations for the previous JS and A's 82 in total for the children's ones. Rather than going for an even 100 and trying to make it triple figures, we, we only produced six. And it was very purposeful, that decision to, to try and produce recommendations that added to the, those 82 we'd already produced um, and not overwhelm in terms of the number that we're, we're then chucking. So I'm going to pass over to Matthew at this point. Hopefully you've found the dashboard um, and have managed to join our mentee. Matthew, over to you. Uh, are you going to you're going to run this for me? I'll, I'll run it. Yeah. You tell me when so, to go. Hope if you're all on the mentee, you could give me a thumbs up if you have the Empowering Futures dashboard open. I know we can't send the link, but we've got one, four. Ooh. Oh, gosh. Well, at least seven people are paying attention. Hey, oh, fantastic. Um, so I'm going to test you now and you're going to have to navigate through our dashboard and find the answers to these questions. Um, so if you want to go to the slide, Michael, and everyone, if you're not on, you can ask it on now. Like I say, you can Google it, you can follow that link in Rachel's Venti. Um, but we've got 32 appointments, so that's fabulous. So first question. What percentage of year nine Warwickshire students said that most of their class either smoked cigarettes or e-cigarettes in 22 slash 23? I've got a minute for each of these questions. So what can I do to pad the time? Um, the smoking page was quite a, uh, it was an interesting page because a lot of our data wasn't actually local data. It was all things that were either national about children's attitudes, cigarettes and whether they would smoke them or some sort of national prevalence applied to the local population. So with this page, we used our healthy assessment, which is what this question is asking, um, the data that feeds this question. Um, and we, we found something that was quite interesting in that, and that's the, uh, that's the answer to this question. But um, it's an example of trying to keep it, if there's a national trend, um, we'll, we'll use that and try and make it interesting. But uh, if we have a little bit of local data to supplement, then we'll also include that. An example of what to do when you don't have local data. Oh, fab, I got it right. Yeah, so that one was a surprise because it, it, it jumped from the previous years when we had just cigarettes in the question to when we started including e-cigarettes in the question, it jumped up. So that was the interesting thing about that data. Next question. What percentage of secondary school pupils missed ten percent or more of school sessions in 22-23? I'm sure that's the hot topic offer uh, in any um, local authority. It's uh, it's something that's increased nationally. Um, the number of absences in schools is something we wanted to focus on because it's obviously is linked oftentimes to health, um, and it's something that's happened since the COVID pandemic. Um, the increase. It's hard to talk too much about it without giving away the answer. <laughs> Either large or it's small. Or it could be the one in the middle. Or it could be the one in the middle, actually. You know. Just got a few seconds left to try and find that answer. Yeah, twenty-seven percent. So we tried to show the data in this way um, to sort of show the massive increase from the past times to the new times, the, the latest year, and how it has really jumped up. And we tried to segment it a little bit so it's like how many are missing ten percent, how many are missing even more than that, and and show that it's um it's actually quite quite big. Problem. So, next question. How many children are there in Warwickshire who registered on the school census having at least one parent in the regular armed forces? Um, this one uh, Tom showed you, I think. So, you can uh, maybe go back to that page. Um, there is a bit of a trick, though, in this question. You have to select the right. Thing. OK, 
And as part of the process of, I think Tom touched on this, but this page, we met with every single um, person who sort of looks after this group. So these are subject matter experts. So for this one, we have someone within, I think they were within public health, they've moved on, who sort of are really passionate about this. They look after the um, Armed Forces Covenant for the council. So we met with them to get all of the information we needed for this page. And it's similar across the other vulnerable groups that are listed on this page. And it's it's a bit of a misnomer to say vulnerable group. They're not all vulnerable. It's um, more like, you know, could be vulnerable due to some of the circumstances. Ooh. Yeah, 446. And there is a bit of a difference between those who are registered on the school census um, and those who receive sort of people premium funding which um, is the other way of measuring we've sort of separated out because they are slightly different for this group. Which district or borough in Warwickshire has the most children and young people in contact with mental health services? For this page, we, um, we had just done a mental health children and young people day SNA, uh, last year. And we'd not was 2023 we published. It, it was 2023, yeah. Um, and that was a long document. But we had worked very closely with uh, people within the NHS and got them to access the mental health services data set on our behalf, and really worked with them to get some to some really good measures that we thought showed some of the some of the issues within service and um, and who was accessing services. Um, and we've, we basically just imported those visuals um, over from that document, and now we have them live and we're going to keep them updated. So we have an updated data from the, the print document, and then now um, it will be monitored going forward. And we hope to actually expand this section and bring some more, some more indicators over from that report. Yes, now need some better. So I'm not sure if you know much about Warwickshire, but we have a bit of a north-south divide in our county. Um, some we have higher deprivation levels in the north versus the south, which has like Warwick and Stratford on Avon. Um, and we do find that a lot of indicators align to that, and um, we have more people in need uh, in the north than in the south sometimes. An ultimate question. Can we take this one? What percentage of year six children are classified as obese in the southern JSNA area? One of the things um, that I like to do when I go on this report and show people is uh, on obesity, if you have it on reception age and then you switch to year six, the whole map gets darker. And that's because um, obesity levels at year six are much higher than at reception age. Um, And you'll see on that we, also, we have that north south divide. We have more children um, that are obese in the north than the south, both for reception and and year uh, six. I think another example is bringing starting to think about things from previous JSNAs because we had these indicators in the north to five, but actually then having it updated um, is again bringing that one to life in a in a new way. Fifteen percent, and if, I mean adults. Obviously, it's about it's almost a third of adults in England are obese. So if you can almost think of it as like a if we don't change something, it's almost like an escalator. We just keep you know it will increase if we don't do something about this. Um, and obviously, two thirds of adults are either overweight or obese in England. Okay, last question. I don't even know what the question is. I'm excited about that. Because on the question, how many children in year seven in Warwickshire receive an, e an education healthcare plan for speech, language, and communication needs? I'm not sure if you're aware what an EHCP is, but essentially, if you if you need additional support, you can apply for and sort of uh, be tested to see if you need one. And, and it's quite a complex process, but um, if you have one, it sort of unlocks extra funding um, for you that is assigned to to meet your need. Um, and speech, language, and communication needs is quite a hot topic issue um, since the pandemic. More children, young people are entering school with speech, language, and communication needs. But this question is um, is a little bit about 
well, I'll tell you when we're going to be but, um, <laughs> but we are seeing an increase generally. Hundred and three. And there's an ink there's sort of a drop off at year seven. Um we found going so from primary school, then in secondary school it just suddenly drops off. And that's because um both in SCN support and EHCP, just fewer uh people are registered with it. Um and there's less support available to those in secondary schools um from our local provider. I won't ask anybody to uh say who who they are, unless they are really proud of it, you can come off mute and say if you are Agent X9, is, is it you, Tom? <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I didn't participate. No, that would be okay. Very, cheating. very fair here. Well, well done to Agent X9. That was really fab. And I'm, I hope that's given you a good idea of um, how to use it. And I hope you do explore it a bit more in your, in your own time. So I think it's coming back to me now to just talk a little bit about um, the project management approach we took for this and sort of why we took it. Um, we use something called Agile Project Management Approach, which is a, a methodology that stems originally from software development. And the, the clearest example I always think about it is anybody who has a phone and every week gets the latest update from Facebook and it seems eternal. That, that's an example of sort of agile coming around. It's developmental, it's constantly in the background ground developing. And it's a, a really good approach to project management that you can take if there are certain um, certain things about your project that or certain circumstances. And that list down there summarizes them. Um, for us specifically, there were a couple of things that we wanted to use agile for. The first is this is a new type of JSNA for us. We've not done a dashboard before, and so it's quite new developmental. We wanted to see how it goes rather and sort of be able to review and have regular reflections on the process. And this is something that Agile is very good for. We wanted some extra help with project pacing. I mentioned before that you know, we tended to let things slip to the last few four months or so of the project um, and spend too long discussing approach for it. And, and again, Agile is something that helps pace that um, and we also wanted something that gives us that ongoing potential so when we produced a document of a jsna we did the nine months put down the document and we produced it tick not with this jsna we wanted something that would allow us to regularly come back to it in a structured way and again agile agile gives us this approach some of you will already know what Agile is. For those who don't, I'm going to try and do a very quick summary of it and then sort of talk about how we edited and used it um, for our purposes. So Agile and more specifically Scrum, which is a type of Agile, um, follows the process in, in this visual. And for me, there's sort of four key areas. We start with a vision. So the vision with this is a, a dashboard, an Empowering Futures dashboard. That's sort of our, our, our vision in mind and product. From that, we then create user stories. So these are um, things that our customers want from it. The more specific these are, the better. So a bad user story would be, I want a dashboard because that tells us nothing. A really good user story would be, I want a page on a dashboard which shows me obesity across our 22 geographies and can do these colours and, and sort of rag rate it or, or, or how have you. And as part of the user story, we also want to know how it's used so how are they going to use it why do they want it um is it just something that they think is interesting or is there a specific commissioning reason or or similar we collect all of these user stories and we put it in what is called a backlog um, and the idea with a backlog is it's a place where we can store all of the ideas and then we go through it and prioritize them so what are the, the most important we achieve what are wants but actually not not crucial for the project um, and we can then make these into a list and move into sprints. Now, sprints are fixed length periods of time, which is basically to do work. And uh, the classic example on here is a two to three week sprint. And you bring from your backlog these tasks that can fill two to three weeks. And there's a careful bit of management here that you don't overload a sprint or equally underload it. But the idea is you bring a certain number of 
of things into the sprint and you spend two to three weeks focusing on them. And as part of that, you do a daily meeting. So the idea is every day you meet and you say what you did the previous day and what you aim to do this day. Are there any risks? Are there any um, any problems that are worth flagging? And you have that opportunity. And then at the end of each sprint, you show the product and you um, you demo it and, and sort of what you've done. And you also do a sprint retrospective. So you think back over the sprint and you go, what went well and do a little lessons learned. And then you go back to your sprint backlog and the product backlog and you pull over the next things and you start the next sprint and it's sort of incremental. And of course, you can always add things to your product backlog as you go along. In terms of how we used it for this, we had to edit it a bit to make it work for us. So we still started with a vision. In terms of our user stories, we structured them around these six high impact areas, acknowledging that we needed to produce something on all six. And then our sprints, we dedicated six weeks instead of two to three. And part of this was acknowledging that um, Agile normally dictates that it's everybody's full time job. That's not the case with us. We have other JSNAs going on. Our analysts work on loads of different projects, so we, we just don't have that capacity. Whereas doing six weeks gives us that bit longer and acknowledges that. And instead of doing a daily scrum, we did a weekly one that served the same purpose. And a really important part of that is that it's not only analysts meeting, it's also our customers and our stakeholders coming to it so they can provide feedback. We had a sprint review meeting. Now with JSNAs, we tend to have a, a task and finish group and a data subgroup. So we just align them to be the place where we can come and give a full demo. Um, and we also then did a sprint retrospective at the end of six weeks and did a lessons learned and tried to take that forward. In terms of our experience then, we had positives and we had challenges. Um, and this is a bit of a summary of it. And I, I'm gonna highlight three of each. I think from the positives, one of the the top positives was our customer engagement um i think matthew and i always talk about how with previous jsnas you send off an email to a customer or a stakeholder and you, you expect a response in a couple of weeks we were getting responses in a couple of hours and we were finding customers were regularly coming to the meetings and really engaging and helping to shape it much more than previous jsnas so agile had a huge benefit there it definitely helped our project pace, although I'll talk a little bit how, about how we fell off the agile bandwagon towards the end. But it certainly meant that throughout we were pacing it a lot better and we started producing a product that could be used a lot earlier. And also with project structure in terms of having those six um, high impact areas, but also assigning roles to people, making sure people um, knew what actions they had and deadlines for actions. It added a lot of great structure for that. Some of the challenges, agile buy-in, um, it's quite time intensive. People need to be putting time in their diaries to focus on it. It uses language that people aren't familiar with. Already I've used Sprint, I've used Backlog, I've used customers rather than stakeholders. This is all agile language that is somebody new coming into it, you, you just don't understand. So making sure people are aware of that and know what, what all of that means. We had a large scope. We had six high impact areas that are each incredibly broad. And actually, in a way, we used Agile to help manage that scope as opposed to necessarily do Agile at its purest, which is using it very much developmental, start with one question and sort of build on it. And we did fizzle out a bit on Agile, if we're being completely honest. We aimed to run six sprints. We ran the first three, which which went very well from from our perspective. I think the first one we had a lot of lessons learned. The second and third went really well. The fourth one we tried to do as a hackathon, which had mixed success and, of course, slightly different structure to that. And then we realised that um, we needed extra sprints, so we hadn't allowed anything for sort of designing the dashboard. And we found that buy-in from wider stakeholders. So Matthew talked about going and speaking to different teams around the vulnerable populations that caused a, a big backlog because it, they just took longer. They weren't on our time scale. So we sort of fizzled out from that. But um, moving on to sort of thinking about the initial impact of this, one of these is that Agile project management is something that we're, we're very much taking forward as part of the JSNA work program, other areas of public health, thinking about how they can use it, which is a great success. 
we've had a lot of positive feedback on the dashboard so far, which is which is great. And it's actually helped shape our future JSNA work program. So we're now aiming for a suite of three life course dashboards. This is going to be the first, the children and young person one. And we're then aiming to do an adults one and an older adults one. There's been a subgroup set up as part of um, our health and wellbeing board structure, which uh, is, is specific to lead to lead on actions from this JSNA, so something very operational and really trying to drive impact. And also that children and young person MEC offer I mentioned at the beginning is, is using this information to help target messages and, and areas for it. I'm going to pass to Matthew for a few reflections for BI and, and sort of how the councils use data beyond this. I'll keep it brief in case anybody has any questions, but um, I think my reflections for the project are by confining to such a small page, every single page of that dashboard, maybe, maybe we have 20 or so pages in total, um, it makes you really focus on what you should include. And in public health data, we do try to keep things snappy. We like to show things in the most eye-catching way to drive action. Um, and I think that we have done that with this report. We focus on the most important um, message for each uh, topic. Um, and we and we've had to try using the, the data tools we have with Power BI to squeeze as much onto a page as possible. It may look like a page, but it's actually pages within a page oftentimes. Um, we have raised the bar a little bit for data in our organization and, and people are wanting more punchy data. They're wanting more dashboards. Um, so that is a bit of an implication with BI. We will have to support that. We'll have to support this going forward. We've agreed to do that, but it's not conditional on any on anything. We are tracking the usage of this and we'll only update it if it's being used. And if it's not being used, then we'll keep putting the message out. We'll keep bringing it to people to use it. Um, but ultimately, it needs to be used to be maintained. And that's something that we um, are quite strong. So we, we set up all of our tracking so we can see our stats on this. Um, and the Agile, it was difficult to work in that way um, when it's not, you know, the JSA is one part of the business of intelligence team's uh, work. We have other things. So really that would work best if all of our work was put through sprints and the JSNA ones were prioritized if, you know, the JSNA was due, say, six months. We'll prioritize some of those in each sprint and put some of the other pieces of work in. Um, so I think it would work best if, if we were working all on it um, or if you could put other things in as well. And so that's something we can think about for the future. But those are sort of my reflections on, on the project. Thank you, Matthew. So we've come to the end of our slides. We've got one here for any questions or thoughts about the work, but also, as we mentioned earlier, if there's any best, best practice from JSNAs you've done and would like to share, we'd, we'd love to hear about it. Okay. Well, thank you all ever so much for sharing that with us. I can't, as you know, some people, including yourselves, can't see the chat. Um, so if people haven't put any uh, questions in the chat. There are a couple uh, in the uh, in in my mentee. <laughs> Yours looks so much better than mine. I need to, I need to uh, I need to get my act together, don't I? I've just used the same mentee for about a thousand years now, and I need. I, I clearly need to... Oh, bit of, bit of echo there. Um, yes, so very impressive mentee. You get full marks for that, uh, for making me look so bad. You know, I'll um, I'll excuse you on this occasion. That's absolutely fine. Um, so what, what did I say? So before I, there's a couple of questions which I'll come to in a sec. But I just thanks ever so much for uh, taking us on that journey of you developing this, of your the JSNA in, in this way. I think it's it's fascinating, very impressive as well. Um, there are dashboards and there are dashboards aren't there there's there's uh, uh there's there's ones which are static and that take so long to up, 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 um to keep up to date and don't necessarily give information and, and findings and recommendations and tell you the whole picture they just leave you wanting more and um aren't necessarily that helpful this this isn't that sort this is a uh, clearly very interactive um, you made us interact with your dashboard you, you tested us you you realized without knowing uh, that i'm very um, competitive 
<laughs> and, I, and I didn't win, so that's another yeah. another point against me today. I will invite you back. To, this is this is this is all good. <laughs> um, but it was yeah, it's, it's really impressive um, the, the engagement that you had uh, and sort of established with your your customers uh, along along the way as well. Clearly, very important and and important going forward as well for you to sustain it and, and allow it to grow. <clears throat> Feels like you want to do um, agile all over the place and that it's um, you, you can see it being of value to other because it's worked for you you can see it being of value to other areas of work and so on that one of the questions was uh, what what in the first place led you to try agile uh, and, and, and to get an understanding of agile so had you used it before had it is, did somebody recommend it to you well how did how did that how did that bit start um it, it was a recommendation one of our consultants okay. in public health turned up one day um, to myself and the BI team went, I've just read this thing about agile project management. We should do it. And then sort of <laughs> left Excellent. and we were left with the idea. And then mm. it sort of seemed to align quite nicely with this as a piece of work. And I used yeah. to work in um, software development. So I was quite uh, familiar with uh, the process. So I was so quite seems, comfortable seems and happy to, to start and I, yeah. Yeah, that's no, that's it's, it's it's interesting, and it's um, the fact that it kind of solved some of the the typical problems I think that you were saying in terms of project management, and getting projects done on time, um, and then I was sort of uh, and I was kind of like, oh yeah, that's that's ha well, it's happened to us all, hasn't it? Where you you get somewhere in a project and you you, you don't really necessarily um, spread the work out as, as 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 maybe you should, and this helps with that clearly. So we uh, the strategy in it, we we were supporting the. Um, the new hospital program and our data science team use agile uh, an agile approach so they're they're always telling us about the next sprint and when it's due and what's going to and these specific things that are going to come out of it so I'm, I'm i'm used i'm used to all the the terminology from our own guys um and it worked that works really well that because it's so clear at the end of the sprint this is what's going to come out uh mm -hmm. easier for them um during that type of tighter process I, I can see that during when you came to the end of the your process and you were talking about talking to these other groups you can, I can just see that's that's nece not necessarily going to be a, as close a fit to some of the things that you want but you just have to be you have to be flexible with your agile don't you yeah <laughs> they'll, they'll <Absolutely>, that's it. <laughs> yeah. uh, excellent so um there's a the couple of other questions and I'll what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll do a couple of them we're close to time but um if we don't we won't be able to get through them all there's, there's an awful lot of interest i have to say i'm not going to show you the page because you'll just you'll you'll just go Whoa, um and not, not know which ones to pick but if i could share these with you after the session today if you'd be so kind as to respond to them and then i can share them with with people after, after the session and without even looking i know people will be wanting the slides as well so if you're if you're able to share the slides and i can i can pop them on the website along with the recording that'd be really helpful so let, let's just see if we can just do two questions so one one of the first questions that came up during the presentation was how do nhs trusts um engage with you on this or or, or or what do they do what do they do differently as a result of engaging with you on this or is this something that is is going to happen next so i think in terms of what they do differently um i will probably come back to that question in email because it's a slightly long-winded answer yeah, and we're also okay. working on some jsna impact stuff which um will right. feed into that mm -hmm. um in terms of engaging with them we have three place partnerships which have nhs trust representation and the jsna is a product that always goes to them they sit on our jsna strategic groups we have that two-way conversation mm -hmm. equally we almost always have icb analysts working on um jsnas actually again flying the flag for agile having that shorter period being able to bring stakeholders in actually worked better for bringing in some of the specialists from trusts and having those mm -hmm. conversations because we sure. weren't trying to invite them to groups for nine months it was come for two weeks and help yeah. us and then you can go yeah um so it was yeah, definitely beneficial for that 
Yeah. Okay. Now that's that's really helpful, and I can see that as being a um, sort of a, a different kind of relationship, but uh, and not having to commit to those weekly, monthly meetings, uh, which we well, aren't necessarily going to contribute to each time. That's very helpful. So my last my last comment, and I'll share the other questions afterwards. I've got uh, questions about IMD. I've got questions about your intended audience uh, and uh, the the impact that you're in intending to have. And I think that I'm sure you, you will know all the answers to all these. They aren't they aren't tests. But I'd just like to finish on one which said this is very very impressive um, and you're raising the bar lots of food for thought so th thank, thank you very much for that um, all, all, all three of you thank you for thank you for coming today I'm glad that Fran introduced me to you um, I don't think she's on the call today but um, that's um, I'm, I'm glad she did if you're not already part of the analyst network I'm, I'll, I'll either pop you on that or on the strategy unit mailing list so that we can keep in contact but thank you thank you very much enjoy the rest of your day and um, hopefully you can come back and give us some updates in the future sometime Sounds great. No, a pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, everyone. And I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank okay. Bye-bye.